confirms the existence of the CNO cycle and again tests these stellar evolution theories. Our sun-like star is now rapidly climbing the asymptotic giant branch, or the AGB. During this brief 20 million years, its carbon-oxygen core will steadily contract and heat up. Nuclear fusion is only occurring in a helium-burning shell, and above it lies a mostly helium non-burning shell with a thin, nearly dormant hydrogen-burning shell above that. Externally, the sun-like star swells, becoming cooler and brighter. It will be brighter than its previous ascent up the red giant branch, and it will occur much faster than 20 million years compared to 600 million years. If this were the sun, then its outer layers would expand to about 85% of an astronomical unit, once again nearly to Earth's orbit. The Earth would no longer be there to greet its increase, having been aerodynamically dragged into its doom during the red giant phase. Now, it's likely Mars's turn to fall inward. Generally, for such stars, the surface temperature drops to about 3200 Kelvin, but the luminosity significantly increases due to the core's incredible heat generated by the helium shell burning. This enhanced luminosity leads to a shorter lifespan in this evolutionary phase because faster burning equals a shorter lifespan. As it reaches the upper portion of the asymptotic giant branch, the quiet hydrogen burning shell reignites and dominates the star's luminosity source. This time, however, the helium burning shell is being forced to occupy an ever narrowing layer of the star's core. It also begins to detonate on and off semi-periodically. These repeating helium shell flashes occur when the hydrogen burning shell dumps helium ash onto the helium layer below increasing the mass and forcing it to become slightly degenerate. At some point in this dumping, the temperature at the base of the helium shell increases enough to cause a helium shell flash. This is close to the same process as the helium core flashes of low mass stars, but without their huge energy output. Each flash drives the hydrogen burning shell outward, cooling it and temporarily shutting it down. Once the helium shell burning calms down, the hydrogen burning shell turns back on and the cycle starts all over again. The time between each pulse depends on the mass of the star. Higher mass stars, around five or so solar masses, can do pulses every few thousand years. But low mass stars, down to about 60% of a solar mass, can take hundreds of thousands of years between pulses. Importantly, each pulse is stronger than the previous. The graph that you're looking at comes from a simulation for a star with about 60% of the mass of the Sun, and it comes from a 1982 Astrophysical Journal article written by Iko Ibn, a pioneer for such stellar interior modeling. It details the luminosity as a function of time. This sequence for a low-mass star lasts about two and a half million years. You can clearly see the effect of the flash radically increasing the luminosity followed by a sharp drop in luminosity, which are the spikes in the graph. Near the tip of the AGB, the dominant source of the star's energy is coming from the hydrogen burning shell. But when a helium flash occurs, the hydrogen burning nearly stops. This means from an outside observer, the star's radius decreases during a flash, as well as its total luminosity, but its effective temperature increases. These shell flashes last longer than the helium core flashes, but not by much, as you can see by the slenderness of the spikes. When they abate, it's because, once again, that energy from the flash went mostly into lifting the electron degeneracy. Once that happens, gravity wins out and the hydrogen burning shell reaches closer to the core, quickly re-dominating the total energy output. The star will then return to a new state that's close to its previous surface radius, luminosity, and effective temperature. But now, it's a bit more luminous and a bit lower surface temperature. After each flash, the luminosity starts at a lower point, again dumping helium ash into the growingly degenerate helium burning shell. This repetition continues throughout the star's life on the upper reaches of the asymptotic giant branch. For stars slightly more massive than the Sun, say five or so solar masses, these thermal pulses create yet another deep convection cycle, which brings up carbon-rich material to the surface. This can be seen in the spectra of red giant stars. Notice in this sample spectrum that we're focusing on the visible wavelength bands, which are between 4,000 and 7,000 angstroms. Nearly all the emission is in the red end. This is typical for such carbon stars, 
where you see the banding absorption features due to numerous and varied carbon molecules, such as silicon carbide, in the star's expanded envelope. Carbon stars have recently become extremely important for cosmology. The tip of the asymptotic giant branch can be completely characterized by these carbon stars, making this part of the HR diagram a good standard candle distance indicator, as long as you have a large enough sample of stars in a distant galaxy. This physical process allowed a recent team, led by Wendy Friedman at the University of Chicago, to publish that the Hubble tension can be resolved by studying these stars using the James Webb Space Telescope's better resolution. But that's for another video. It's important to note that carbon stars are numerically predicted outcome of the stellar interior simulations of stars more massive than the Sun in their autumn years. These star spectra show evidence of stellar nucleosynthesis as predicted by these models. Now, these kinds of stars are very frequently variable stars, meaning they get brighter and dimmer through time. One known group of well-observed variable stars are called LPVs, or Long Period Variables. These stars are observed regularly by both professional and amateur astronomers. They range in pulsation timings between three months and about two years. The variable star named Myra, or Omicron Ceti, is one such star. This light curve is provided by the American Association of Variable Star Observers and shows the last six years of data. Most of these observations are visually by eye, either with binoculars or through a telescope. Myra can vary up to seven magnitudes, and remember that a difference of five magnitudes is a difference of brightness of a hundred times. So this star can vary over a hundred times in brightness over about 300 days. Looking at Myra in ultraviolet and visible compared, we see that Myra's space velocity leads to an interesting self-interaction. I've alluded to the mass loss that can occur with these red giant stars, especially the AGB stars, during their thermal pulse phase. Myra's motion, combined with the mass loss, creates a bow shock. Since this outflow is principally composed of hydrogen, we see the Lyman alpha UV emission due to shock-heated gas. This motion is so fast that the hydrogen gas is ionized, and the emission is due to the recombination of the electron back into a hydrogen atom. Watch my video series on the interaction of atoms and light to learn more about this process. 